Hello everyone, it's Bree here from Blossom and Branch Farm and today I wanted to talk to you about something a little bit different. So we've been talking a lot about garden plants and things that I am growing this year, but today I wanna to talk about five things that I am not going to grow this year and why. Let's go. So first of all, I wanna say, just because I'm not growing these things doesn't mean that you shouldn't be growing them. I don't want you to take this information as don't grow these things. It's just things that I am choosing not to grow. And some of that has to do with climate. Some of it is financial, some of it is environmental. So it's just all over the board, but I just thought it would be a fun video. So please don't take it personally. If I name something that you're really excited about growing, don't let me discourage you if it's something that you wanna grow. All right, so I'm gonna start with the first and probably most surprising thing that I am not going to be growing this year. So we do have these planted already. They're starting to come up, hint, hint but we planted these last fall and I will not be planting them this fall. And those are tulips. There's a couple of reasons for why I'm not gonna be growing tulips again. From a financial standpoint, growing tulips as a cut flower farmer <laughs> doesn't really make a lot of sense. And as a home gardener, if you're growing the fancier tulips, you may already know this, but they don't tend to perennialize very well. So there are a couple of varieties of tulips that perennialize really well. One of them is the Darwin variety, but a lot of the fancier ones that people like to buy from us here at the farm, the kind of ruffly peony shaped or rose looking tulips, they don't perennialize. And the other thing is in order to get stem length, a lot of the times we have to pull the whole bulb up and out of the soil in order to get the stem length that we need to sell them in a bouquet. So what that means is we have to rebuy our bulbs every year. So this gets expensive in a couple ways. One is the bulb cost and two is the labor cost. So pulling up the tulips, cleaning off the soil, getting them ready to sell, and then also getting the area prepped and planted in the fall. And the bulbs are expensive, especially for the fancier tulips. So when you go to the grocery store and you see that there are tulips selling for $10 a bunch, that means we're making zero money. It actually means we're losing money because of all the time that we put into planting and harvesting. Uh, if we're trying to compete with grocery store prices, and we don't, by the way, I do not do that. I say, this is my cost, <laughs> pay it or don't. Um, but if you know someone goes to the grocery store and says, well, why are your tulips 20 or $30 a bunch and these ones are $10 a bunch? Well, Anyway, what you need to know is that's the first reason why I'm not going to be growing tulips again next year. It's also a climate issue. Um, as our winters are very up and down, we're zone five, six. Sometimes we get great winters for tulips. This winter, for example, was a great winter. We had a very cold winter, which is good for tulips. They got all the chill hours that they need. I think we're gonna have nice long stems. We've got a lot of snow and moisture. But last winter, we had a very warm winter, very dry, and so our tulips were horrible. I probably lost 90% of my investment on my tulips last year. So very up and down, very inconsistent from the cut flower world standpoint. They don't make sense for me any longer. The other reason why I'm not going to grow tulips this year actually has more to do with environmental issues. So one of the fungicides that is really commonly used on tulips also happens to be one of the antifungals that is used in the medical world on a fungal spore that's really common. And I would butcher it if I tried to say it, but I'll put it down below. But this fungicide is pretty much the only one that is effective against this fungus. And we breathe in this fungus all the time. It can be common in compost piles. Usually it's not fatal unless you have a compromised immune system. But if you have a compromised immune system and you inhale this fungus, it can actually be fatal. And it used to be always fatal until they developed this antifungal that worked. So this antifungal worked for a while. And then now what they're finding is that because of the overuse of fungicides in cut flowers, in flower bulb production, for example, tulips have a very high rate of this fungicide, that now there is a fungicide resistant strain of this fungus. So it's now killing people again. Um, anyway, all that being said, I don't like the overuse of fungicides in the bulbs and there's just not a lot of options when it comes to buying bulbs yet. There's not really many bulbs. I think there's maybe one producer in the US of bulbs. Most of them are produced in the Netherlands. We have very little control over what's in them. Um, I sure don't know how to replicate bulbs myself and I think it would take up a lot more time and space and energy and money than is worth. So all that being said, I'm gonna post the article down below if you wanna read more about that, please do because it's really important, I think, in the gardening world to know about this fungicide because it's common in a couple products that are sold in garden centers. And you don't wanna be messing with fungicides if you don't need to, people. I also don't want plants that are covered in fungicide in my soil. It's part of the reason why I grow from seed. So anyway, on that being said, 
Sorry, tulips, you're out. The second one is Cosmos. So I love Cosmos in event florals. I love them for a bridal bouquet. I love them for a centerpiece that only needs to last for a day. But beyond that, even if we harvest Cosmos at just the right time, which is when they're still in a tight ball before the petals have lifted, they still have a limited vase life, maybe a few days, and then they just don't look that impressive in the vase anymore. They drop petals really quickly. Uh, they reseed really readily. Actually, in some areas of the United States, Cosmos are invasive, so watch out for that. Specifically, I was really disappointed in the Apricot Lemonade Cosmos, and they are so pretty on the seed packet, and they're beautiful when they bloom for like a second. <laughs> and then they don't, they just look old really fast. Um, the blooms are really small. The plant was disappointing. I just, ugh, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing Cosmos. I'm doing a few very limited number of white Cosmos for bridal bouquets and then that's it. Cause you have to keep up with deadheading them or else they spread everywhere. So sorry, Cosmos, you're out. Number three on my list of flowers I'm not growing this year is the chocolate lace flower. Dara, Dacus Carota. It is Queen Anne's lace, just hybridized to bloom in a different color. So it's hybridized to bloom in kind of this purplish, pinkish, whitish. When I first started growing this flower, I was like, oh, this flower is amazing. Now you do have to harvest it at just the right point. So it's a little tricky because if you harvest too early, it flops. But once you get the harvest nailed down, it's a really unique and pretty flower. So this is why we're not growing it. It's wildly invasive, okay? Yeah, if you know Queen Anne's Lace, you probably don't wanna know Queen Anne's Lace, you know what I mean? It's very aggressive, it spreads very easily, tons of seeds, I'm talking so many seeds. And again, it's another one that if you don't keep deadheaded, you will find forever. I haven't grown it in four years and I am still having seedlings of it coming up in the field. I don't know where they're coming from, just oh, a horrendous, spreader. So I actually talked to Dr. Doug Talamy about this plant because a lot of flower farmers seem to think that this version, this variety is not invasive like regular Queen Anne's lace because it's purple. It's still going to have the same characteristics as the parent plant. It's not bred to be sterile. It still seeds, it still spreads just like the parent plant does. But the downside actually of chocolate lace flower over Queen Anne's lace is Queen Anne's lace actually serves as a host plant for the swallowtail. But what they've found in doing all this research with pollinators is that if you change the bloom color of the flower, that actually greatly impacts its ability to serve as a host plant. So not only is this plant pretty invasive and I've seen it being invasive in my field um, and in my neighbor's yards, I've actually been pulling some out of my neighbor's front yards. Not only is it invasive, but it's also been bred to be a different bloom color. So now it's also not even serving the swallowtail like it was before, which was kind of the one redeeming quality of it despite being invasive. Anyway, it's a headache. I'm not growing it again ever. Take that as you will. Number two, status. I'm sorry, status. I know a lot of people love status. I love status after it's harvested. <laughs> after I've cut status, I like status. Um, status you've probably seen in the grocery store is kind of the, usually it's like the kind of ugliest purple, like flower that doesn't really do much. There are some really cool varieties that you can grow at home. Sorbet colors and pinks and, and whites and some blues and purples. It comes in a lot of different colors and it's beautiful as a dried flower, but the harvest, I can't get past the harvesting of it. It grows tall, it flops, it's really sharp after it's dried, so it hurts to work with. I don't like working with it. Um, so it's a great dried flower, but I'm not growing it anymore. And that's that. And the last one I'm not growing this year is Scabiosa, specifically the annual Scabiosa. So annual Scabiosa comes in, my favorite colors have been Black Knight, which is this dark burgundy. We've also grown the scoop varieties in the past. Scabiosa is a pretty annual and it's very floriferous, puts off a ton of blooms, but again, the harvest and deadheading of it is such a pain. So I think we didn't even grow that many last year but deadheading, even what we did grow, was so time consuming that it made it not worth growing, really. Deadheading it is a lot of work. It takes up a lot of time and it is a fun little pop of color and we always get comments about it. So I'll tell you what I am growing in the Scabiosa family. Ooh, I'm falling off my chair. I'm actually growing the perennial Scabiosa. So there's a perennial Scabiosa. We have a blue and a white and those ones will be growing this year because I don't have to put the effort in with replanting them. 
They don't bloom as much as the annual version, so deadheading isn't as difficult and harvesting isn't as difficult. So I'm growing the perennial version, and then I'm also growing a variety called Starflower. And I'm growing the Starflower specifically because I use them a lot in personal. So boutonnieres, bouquets, they're really um, fun because they hold up really well, they dry really well, and they're not as bad to harvest as some of the other scabiosas. With that, I'm sorry, scabiosa, you are the last flower that we're cutting from the field this year. So that's it. Those are the five flowers that we're not growing this year. Let me know in the comments below what you're not growing this year and why. I always love to hear about it. And again, please don't let this discourage you if you wanted to grow any of these things, but I do encourage you to research if you are wondering about any of the things that I talked about in terms of ecology, invasiveness, the fungicide issue, I think are really good things to be read up on. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. It means a lot to us on the farm and it helps us keep going. So we appreciate you all. See you next time on the farm.